everybody, welcome. Right, okay, so I'm Taylor, I direct The Gund, I'm a professor at Rubenstein, and uh, welcoming Francisco is a great pleasure to campus. Uh, he works at Katia, which is um, a research institute essentially around sustainable agriculture and biodiversity, forestry in Costa Rica, serving all of Latin America, kind of like a land-grant university does. So he directs the research program for that whole place. He's also as appointed as an associate professor at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden. And he's essentially an environmental and behavioral economist, um, but are also a real leader in sort of private and public management of natural resources from all sorts of angles, not just economic ones. Um, specializes in everything from national policy to individual behaviors and how we can understand and use those to better manage natural resources. He's um, a really big thinker about sustainability broadly and the author of a lot of papers um, that have had a lot of influence. So that's sort of the basic professional thing. It's also personally a great pleasure because Francisco was my host when I was on sabbatical last year. So I visited his institution for 10 months and he was the host there. And now I get to reciprocate for like six days here in Vermont in a very, very different climate as you might imagine. Um, while we're on sabbatical, we started two research projects together. We're in the middle of proposing a third, and we're talking about um, bringing UVM and the Gun Institute into a couple of the international consortia and networks that uh, Francisco helps to lead. So um, during that sabbatical, Francisco made time to um, go to lunch with me every week at this kind of diner down the road from the Institute, and so I got to know him personally. Uh, really well too. He's a delightful person to talk with, collaborate with, hang out with, a really thoughtful leader and a pleasure to have here visiting us in Vermont. So please help me in welcoming Francisco Alpizar. Thank you, Taylor, for those, those very kind uh, words. Uh, my voice sounds strange from here. Is it strange also on the mic? Let me just lower it a little bit. Okay, now it's better for me too. <laughs> okay, um, so I'm very honored to be here. Uh, I, I really wanted to be here. Proof of that is that I just spent four days coming here uh, between Costa Rica. I left on Saturday morning and I arrived uh, yesterday night. Um, it's been a, a long journey, uh, but one that I, I really wanted because um, I've been talking to uh, Taylor for such a long time and the Gund Institute has been on my radar for a long time and it's really something that uh, has so many synergies that the work that, with the work that we do in, in Central America, it has so many synergies with this uh, Environment for Development Initiative that we can talk a little bit more later if you want. Uh, so I think it's a, it's a marriage made uh, in heaven for many reasons. And, uh, very excited to pursue those with a visit here and many potentially to come. So today I'm going to talk about behavioral insights for the design of environmental policies. I'm an environmental economist, but most of my work has been on behavioral economics, doing experiments and conceptualizing the role that micro decisions have on environmental problems. Uh, in this talk in particular, I'm going to try to um, argue that these insights, although they are very Although we study them at the individual level, they have something to say at the, at the larger scale. And I'm going to be talking a little, uh, uh, about large-scale collective action dilemmas. And I'm going to define what I mean by that too. So what is the rationale? Basically, each day we make these millions and millions of tiny decisions from turning off the light, uh, putting the heating or the air conditioning, in my case, higher up. Um, and all those tiny decisions eventually have a, a, an, an enormous impact on the Earth's resource base. Uh, some of that impact is already uh, having very big consequences. And what you have there are the, these nine planetary boundaries that uh, ecologists have put forward. Uh, three of them are on heavy red, biodiversity, phosphorus, nitrogen, uh, nitrogen uh, biodiversity loss, and climate change in particular. So and all those three are related, again, to tiny decisions that we make every day. So in order to change our development path, we need 
to change the way that humans make those decisions. We need a behavioral change, but we need change in social norms, habits, and so on and so forth. And for that, those things won't happen automatically. We know that uh, humans have this capacity to go directly towards trouble unless we somehow, something makes us change that course. And that something typically is well-designed policies that change behaviors. And what we want is to decouple economic growth and hopefully economic well-being. Uh, and these two things are different, uh, although we usually linked well-being to growth. But we want to decouple that from the depletion of natural resources. So far, despite our technology, despite our advances, big part of the progress we have is at the expense of natural resources that the Earth as a whole doesn't have. And because I'm going to be talking about behavioral economics, the key insight in, uh, behind behavioral economics, everything we know about behavioral economics can be summarized in that key insight, which is that people make decisions by trading off, you know, uh, sacrificing a little bit of this in favor of a little bit of this other. And people make those trade-offs on multiple types of value and not just price. Uh, and by saying that, I'm, I'm already thinking that we need to deconstruct the idea of Amo economicus we have into something that is more credible. Just to be on the same footing, when it, I'm, I'm an economist. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how, how many of you are economists or if there are economists at all in the room. But uh, basically, when we analyze uh, you know, human decision making, we think that that decision making is rational, that is selfish, that is transitive. That means that if A is better than B and B is better than C, then A is also better than C. That is time consistent so that our decisions can be traced back. For example, that transitivity that I just described is valid today as it was 10 years ago, as it will be 10 years from now. The other uh, factor is that humans tend to be, we believe they are risk averse. We don't like risk but we measure risk using objective probabilities. So for example, the probability of having a six in a dice is one six. Uh, that, that is called objective probabilities. The, also, the other assumption, the last assumption, is that we might maximize utility derived from consumption, consumption of goods, food, and so on, also luxury goods, and so on and so forth. Now, the real challenge in behavioral economics is to make that individual, individual utility function much more credible. But we, sh we shouldn't abandon the toolkit of economics. We should just make it more credible. And there is a lot of interest in making it more credible and from very powerful sources. So I'm putting these reports, for example. This is a report by OECD looking at behavioral insights into public policy, a very good summary. This is the Green Growth uh, Knowledge Platform. This is a report. Uh, I was part of that report. We just put it out looking at how behavior, changing behavior is a prerequisite for green growth. And this is the World Bank, the World Development Report, Mind, Society, and Behavior. I think this is from 2015. So there is a lot of interest in this uh, from, for many reasons. And I'm going to be talking about those reasons in this talk. So what do we know? A, a quick summary of what we know. And I've tried to put this into three big uh, pieces of, of uh, information. The first one is bounded rationality. Uh, the second is bounded willpower. And the third, I've chosen to, to call it bounded individual, individuality. So what do I mean by bounded rationality? That is that basically human problem, problem solving is constrained by our, by our cognitive uh, abilities. We have limited cognitive abilities. And sometimes we just don't use any of it. Uh, for example, Sometimes we react to the frame and not to the information contained in a leaflet, for example. Many human decisions are just determined by the way the information is presented. If, if it has green colors or bright colors and so on, we take a decision. Uh, if it has sad colors, we take another decision. Or uh, if you ask people what, what is going to be the temperature, in the, the average temperature in the month of, say, July, but let me draw a number first, and the number is on the high side, then the temperature is going to be higher in July. And if you draw a smaller number, they think the temperature is going to be lower in July. And that is crazy, in a way. That sounds crazy. But no, it's just people, 
people's mind being lazy, and it's okay to be lazy in a way it could be very intelligent to save energy in those uh, cognitive processes. The other uh, finding that comes by this, I, when I say finding, is sort of this sort of systematic findings that, that papers produce uh, uh, one and over and over again, is that individuals are more likely to avoid a loss than to pursue a gain. Uh, this is linked to the fact that people typically use subjective probabilities and not objective probabilities. So for example, I'm Costa Rican, and I did a study looking at loss aversion and whether people use actually subjective versus objective probabilities, and we found that Costa Ricans are very loss averse. But at the same time, they're very optimistic. So if you, if you tell them there are four possible outcomes with equal probabilities from a very bad outcome to a really good outcome, uh, you just told them they're equal probabilities, 25% each. When you see their decision-making processes, you see that they are disregarding those objective probabilities and thinking the, you know, weighting up the probabilities of the good outcomes. And that's very Costa Rican. We think everything is gonna be fine. So even when we told 25%, no, that everything is gonna be fine for some divine purpose. And that's very, very typical. There are some societies where you observe exactly the opposite. Either way, this, this leads to inaction. Many choices, what we believe are choices, are not really choices. They are automatic responses. For example, the default alternative. That's one of the strongest findings in behavioral economics, the fact that people just go on with the default alternative in their computer, in their air conditioning, in their cars, and so on and so forth. The last point, and, and I think this is a particularly Im important one, is that Typically, we do not spend a lot of energy making decisions, so judgment is influenced by whatever first comes to mind. And this is okay for day-to-day -day problems, but when it comes to uh, um, more complex problems, uh, that can lead to very inefficient solutions. Just this Friday, I was talking to the, to the Minister of Environment, or a team of people that are dealing with transportation problems. And we have a lot of congestion, a lot of uh, pollution, a big concern with uh, decarbonization of the Costa Rican economy. And what do you think was their solution? Let's put a big tax on big cars. I'm like, well, what sort of big cars? No, no, just big cars. People should not be allowed to buy a new big car. And I'm like, wait, wait, but that's a very, so what if they buy a one-year-old car? Yeah, yeah, it's tax that too. So new cars and cars that are one year old, and if their motor is very big, we're going to tax that. And I'm like, okay. Well, what about two years? Oh, yeah, yeah, because if, if we tax new cars and cars that are one year old, then people are going to buy cars that are two years old, right? Yeah, yeah, so we tax two, one, and, and new cars. Well, what about three? And what some people, are you not realizing that you're making a wrong assessment? Oh, yeah, maybe we should think a little bit more about this. So there, there is a conversation that was leading or a decision-making process that was just, you know, shooting from the hip uh, and not really doing a, a proper assessment of the information. When it comes to bounded willpower, the, the second group of findings, uh, uh, the, I want to start with this short-sighted choices. People make very short-sighted choices. For example, acquiring credit card debt. Oh, let's go to the mall, let's spend this, this money that we don't have. But then again, you know, because that information is provided to you, that you are going to pay this in a couple of months, right? So this is a short-sighted uh, choice that, that appears obviously contradictory. Um, also, we use different uh, discount rates depending on when the consequences of our actions will happen. So if, if that bank, for example, with a credit card tells you, well, but you don't have to pay next month, you can, instead of 30 days uh, to pay your card, I'm gonna give you 45. Yeah, let's go to the mall. It's the same, right? It's the same discounting problem and you're just you know, making a, a mistake. You are, this is called myopia of intertemporal choices. What is the implications of this? Too little investment, low saving rates, high debt, but also simpler problems like overeating, getting drunk. You, if you get drunk tonight, you're gonna suffer tomorrow. Uh, and probably the day after, in my case. But uh, this is, is a choice that appears contradictory. 
smoking is another example of that. Um, the other problem is this cognitive dissonance. There is some, somehow like a mismatch between the things that we believe and the things that we actually do. So our actions seem to violate transitivity. So for example, that phrase, I'm going to stop procrastinating soon, is a violation of transitivity in itself. Or these cigarettes are killing me. If you know that, then you should stop. But the fact that you, you have the, the R there, you're, that is a violation of transitivity. Or, or, or um, we should be recycling at home. No, it's not like should. If, if recycling you consider it to be good, you should be recycling already at home. All, all this junk food is going to give me a heart attack. Yes, it's going to give you a heart attack because you're not going to change it because your actions are violating transitivity. And finally, bounded individuality. This is something that appears uh, or uh, at the start of, of this, it, most of the papers were showing good things about the fact that humans were always acting, or mostly acting as part of a group and not as individuals, which remember that in economics, we believed it was individual decision-making. The, the, the individuals were making the decision in, from the perspective of the individual. We know now that's not the case. There's a strange noise. And there is uh, things, good things like altruism and fairness concerns. That's true, that's uh, important, of course. But individuals are social creatures also when it comes to bad things. For example, eating shark fin soup. You know, hundreds, thousands of sharks are being killed to, to produce a ridiculous soup that is completely tasteless just because it's fashionable to eat shark fin uh, soup. And despite the efforts of many environmental organizations, shark fin soup remains a problem today as uh, maybe less so, and I'll tell you why, but uh, it's still uh, a problem today. So although you have good things like dog lovers, you know, when, you, when, you have, when people are dog lovers, they really dedicate themselves to the dogs, but then that creates a, a sort of uh, good uh, environment and people interact uh, with each other with the dogs as, as, as the basis of that interaction, it's a very nice community. You also have negative communities, for example, like the park shark fin soup community. Now, the next question that we need to ask is, okay, well, yes, this is all very nice, but why do we really need to fix these things? Are, are these things part of human decision-making as it is? And the answer is that this behavioral falls lead to inefficiencies, inefficiencies just as market failures do. So there are many classical examples in which the government has intervened to force us to correct a behavioral uh, uh, fault. For example, compulsory seat belts or indoor smoking provisions. And, and if you're interested, I, I urge you to, to read that like, Camera et al. paper uh, called Paternalism for Conservatives because he basically develops the justification for uh, intervening in, in the presence of behavioral faults. Now, why is this relevant to environmental problems? Uh, well, as I said at the beginning, many of these environmental problems are caused by habits. Uh, these are hard to change automatic choices, uh, and we need to somehow get in there and fix that decision-making process in order to avoid the loss associated to those choices. We focus too much on the present. We overlook long-term environmental impacts. This is at the heart of environmental problems. Uh, sustainability is also perceived as impersonal. There is nothing I can do. We want it, but still do nothing. So there is transitivity, just as procrastinating with, when it comes to stop eating junk food, procrastinating when it comes to the environment appears, uh, to lead, appears intransitive. Uh, another case is as soon as something works, we stop thinking, so we stop, we do not work our, our minds towards optimal choices, but we stop very quickly. Uh, when, the, when we have a quick solution. When it comes to environmental problems, that is itself a problem. Then there are uh, features of uh, decision-making when it comes to the environment that are a little bit more particular to environmental setting. For example, uh, humans tend not to notice some of the important features of the environment. Sometimes they are very hard and we have cognitive limitations. Explaining carrying capacity, for example, it might be very obvious for you because you're you know, studying these things and so on, but carrying capacity, even biodiversity, is, or the role that biodiversity plays, 
the role that a shark or a mosquito plays in the environment is something that is not easy, understand, uh, not easy to understand. And the other one that I find very frequently is this knowledge acquisition biases. If we think something is irrelevant, was irrelevant in the past, we believe it's going to be irrelevant in the future, and we put it out of our decision-making process. So uh, I found farmers in, in Central America, we, we produce a lot of coffee. We produce the best coffee, actually. And um, I found a lot of farmers suffering terribly from a disease called the coffee leaf rust. And they basically said, well, but I've been, do I've been doing this for years and years and years. Uh, so, so why should I change and use your optimized technological package? I said, well, this led to this disease. Yeah, but I've had the disease in the past and so on. And yeah, but, you know, there is a new setting. You know, temperatures are higher. Rain patterns have changed. Uh, we know that they're going to change even better. So if you continue using the information to the past, you're going to suffer from more disease. Yeah, but you know, I'm too old to change uh, in a way. And behind this is this uh, knowledge acquisition biases. So uh, 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 what I want to say is that unless environmentally friendly choices become habitual, automatic choices, uh, they will not be sustainable choices. And I'm, I'm going to uh, give you a few examples of how to make those choices uh, sustainable. A quick example about the nightmare of climate change. If we describe climate change in very simple terms, it's caused by billions of tiny decisions. Uh, that leads to big consequences, but no, nobody is really responsible. It's impersonal. We all suffer the consequences, though. And, and this situation where our actions made us responsible, but not really, because it's such a tiny responsibility, it's very hard to understand. We have, it goes against our rationality, cognitive limitations. And if we start comparing each other, yeah, I need to worry about climate change, but my neighbor just bought this huge SUV, right? And they are on sale, so I want one too. And, and it gets uh, into our band bounded individuality in that case. It's also associated to a massive distribution of wealth, Climate change is going to affect us all, but very differently depending on where we are in the income distribution and depending on which country we are. And this is an ugly question. When, we, when humans face these ugly questions, typically we like to just push them under the rug. It's, it's too difficult to understand. I'm just going to stop thinking about this. The other problem, uh, and, and it's, it's related to this cost from solving the problem being lumped at the beginning, so today, but the, the damages of inaction are occurring in the future. Uh, but I really want a good life now, and, and probably you deserve all, we all deserve a good life now. Uh, to make things even more complicated, there is this large uncertainty on what is the best solution. What is the size of the damages in the future? What if a technology comes and saves us all? All these questions uh, are there in the back of our mind when we, when we just said, no, come on. Um, this is just too complicated. I'm not going. I'm, humans are bad anyway, making the temporal choices. So we're going to say just drop the, the problem. Um, now, climate change is is one of many la large scale collective action dilemmas. Now, I'm, I'm going to make the claim that behavioral insights are relevant for large scale collective actions. Uh, by large-scale collective action refers to the need to collectively so solve these dilemmas. These are a situation where, where self-interest is in com conflict with collective interest. And there you have a few examples. Climate change, depletion of the open, open seas, antibiotic resistance, and, and many similar cute little things. Um, and these large-scale collective action dilemmas have four characteristics. And this is an ongoing paper uh, I have with a, with a group of, of Swedish colleagues. And this, these are the four characteristics. First, there is a large number of actors, meaning that there is a need for multiple layers of representativeness. So when we are, for example, solving, a, a, and I'm going to be giving you examples of small scale collective action dilemmas, because we know a lot about small scale collective action dilemmas. Actually, Elinor Ostrom uh, won the Nobel Prize on this small scale collective action dilemmas. So I'm going to use small-scale collective action dilemmas to show how hard it is to solve these larger ones. So in a small-scale collective action dilemma, basically, you as an individual represent yourself and your interests in the discussion, in the conversation, the community on how many sheep to bring to the pasture, for example, or 
how much water to draw from the aquifer and so on, or how many trees to cut. But when you have so many actors, and uh, that means that you cannot represent yourself, you are represented by, by somebody, and that somebody probably is represented by somebody else, and those, la those levels of aggregation mean that there are a lot of principal agent problems. So that what, what you want as an individual is hardly reflected on what is sort of negotiated at, at the proper scale. Second, there is a lot of spatial distance between actors. We feel very far away. I mean, a ton of carbon emitted in China, a ton of carbon emitted in Argentina or in Russia or in Alaska is exactly, they are identical one to the other. So in principle, we should worry about, about that, or ocean acidification or antibiotic resistance. Most of the antibiotic resistance we, we are suffering now worldwide is, is not produced here in Vermont. Uh, that you're suffering here in Vermont is not produced in Vermont. It comes from antibiotics being misused in India, for example. So these places are very far away. There's also temporal distances. Uh, between the causes and their effects. And, and lastly, these problems are scientifically complex. It's not, they are not easy to explain. There are very complex feedbacks and interactions between all the, the components of the problem. So the proposition here is that large-scale collective action dilemmas can be tackled with instruments from behavioral sciences if and only if we have individuals work well relating to each other. So if individuals somehow relate to each other, if we share common values and norms, and if there is a joint understanding of what needs to be done, so a joint understanding of the technology. And let me, let me try to convince you about that. So small decisions, small decisions with respect to consumption and production have global consequences. So this UNDP, UNEP report uh, states, for example, that household consumption accounts for at least 60% of the life cycle impact of consumption. The key sectors behind that uh, product life cycle is food, housing, transport, and manufacturing. So in particular, food, housing, and transport, these are all household decisions uh, to a largest degree. So are we really so many and so far away? I'm going to claim that the global consumption patterns act as aggregators of our decision-making process. They bring people together. And they make us eventually, sh and are more and more doing so, they will make us share the same social norms. They will help us create common values. So for example, if I show you this, you know who this guy is, right? And what I'm talking about. But if I were doing this talk in China, they will also know. Or if I do this talk in Peru, in Spanish, they will also know. They will actually be called hashtag me too, even if it's in Spanish or in Chinese. Also communication and social media are bringing us together. Without name, well, Netflix is there, but you know, you all know what this is, right? We all listen to the same music through Spotify. We all use Facebook and share friends worldwide. We all, uh, use Instagram, uh, we look at the same movies, listen to the same music, uh, and so on and so forth. Also, there is a lot of reciprocity and social leaders that transcend borders. This guy, um, Yao Ming, uh, had this campaign, join me in say no to shark bean soup. And with this campaign, he's a very famous, uh, well, you know this because you like basketball, right? Uh, Yao Ming's campaign diminished shark finning by about 50% after his campaign. So that's a very successful campaign by, a, by a, a, a good leader. This guy, maybe you don't know who this guy is because you don't play uh, soccer here. This is Ronaldo, Cristiano Ronaldo, one of the most famous football players, uh, soccer players in the world. And he has no tattoos. Do you know why? because he advocates for donating blood. And uh, he successfully advocates for donating blood. Uh, so he takes his shirt off, both because he's handsome, but also because he wants to show that he donates blood. I, I want to think like, like that. There are also very large conditional cooperation agreements. This, there is something called the Amsterdam Declaration of 2015, and there is a, a similar New York Declaration of 2014 
that groups the biggest companies in Europe and the biggest companies in the US, and they have signed a uh, declaration by which they want to reduce deforestation in their value chains by 50%. And by 2030, they want to have 100% deforestation uh, commodity trading. trading. This is very powerful. These are the biggest supermarket chains, the biggest retailers at the large scale. So there is a convergence of interest. And lastly, there's a joint technology push. These two phones in the, uh, in the bottom, they're identical for all the things. They have the same buttons, they look the same, but one is a Samsung and the other is an iPhone. There's a convergence of uh, technology. The world now is converging to solar energy, to solar powered cars and so on and so forth. And this makes it easier for us as a global group to make decisions. So back to what turns a social dilemma into a large scale collective action dilemma. Uh, these were the same characteristics, but really, we are many, but we are not that different. We share values, we share norms. Uh, we are also so close no matter how far. We are also, there is a lot of complexity in the problems we face, but that complexity is not necessarily our, uh, ours to solve. That complexity uh, can be simplified given the convergence of technologies. We just need to adopt the right technology. We do not understand why that, we don't need to understand why that technology is the right one. And this reduces the problem to temporal distance between causes and effect. So I, what I think we should be doing with behavioral economics is try to solve the intertemporal coordination problem. The other ones we can tap, tackle simply. And to be honest, I, I don't know the solution. I'm just putting it out there for you to produce some of those uh, behavioral tools to actually tackle the intertemporal coordination problem. The other three can be tackled with the knowledge we already have. So this is, uh, I'm, I'm being real, I don't have the solution. So I think that's very exciting in a way because now we just simplify the problem to one coordination problem. It's not a coordination of social norms. It's not that we, we don't know what technology to target. It's not that we are too far away so that something that works in China will not work in the US and vice versa. No, we are all converging to the same social norm. It is the intertemporal coordination that, that needs to be solved here. Now, how can behavioral insights be used into policy design? Basically, there are four big uh, tools. The first one is choice architecture, second one, peer comparison, and so on. Let me walk one by one. When it comes to the choice architecture, we know very simple things. These are concrete tools. So simply, simplify, make information simple, make it available, like energy stars, eco-labeling, all that uh, helps. Make efficient decisions as a matter of habit. For example, efficient light bulbs work very well. Water conserving technologies, they save on water irrespective of what you do at home. That works very well. The default alternative is also one of the most powerful tools we have found in behavioral economics. Just when you have clarity with respect to what the right technology is or what the right decision is, just make it the default alternative. And we will all happily move there without actually suffering too much from from the change. The other one is carbon taxes and communication campaigns. I know that in the US I shouldn't be talking about taxes, but there, is, there are many countries that are trying to use taxes to reduce carbon. And one of the strongest uh, findings of all that literature is that more important than the size of the carbon tax is the communication campaign that follows the tax. Let me give you an, uh, uh, an example, not for carbon. In, in Colombia, they just passed a, a tax on plastic bags. But say that the tax, I, I, Colombian pesos are, have many zeros. I don't want to go there I, because I don't even remember. But let's say that the tax on plastic pack is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 5. So it's nothing. But you are reminded at the cashier that plastic bags have a tax and people don't like taxes, so they don't take plastic bags. So although the tax is completely uh, ridiculous in terms of size, the effect has been enormous. Similarly, with carbon taxes, all you need is to push the tax forward and then follow with a very strong communication campaign. And that would, would potentially work. 
have uh, households compete to become green energy users, for example. This is something, or green water users. There is a very broad literature looking at that, uh, a lot of that literature coming from the US. Uh, I have worked when it comes to uh, combination of public rewards and punishments. Some of my work for Costa Rica shows that punishment is the way forward. Punish people when they misbehave, but it could be the opposite in other countries, right? For example, reward people if garbage is separated at, a, at the household, punish them if not. Goal settings and commitment devices are also very powerful tools. The, the most obvious one um, that is used very frequently is tell your kids you're going to quit smoking, for example. If you tell your kids you're going to quit smoking and you continue smoking, then you're in trouble. The, for me, the biggest behavioral insight, and I say this working with governments in Latin America, I've spent a lot of time working with governments and, and they, they are not beware of the response. And I think the biggest behavioral insight is that individuals always, and by that I mean always, react to policies and rules. Sometimes they just ignore them, sometimes they hate them, sometimes they use it in their favor, sometimes they use it against someone else, sometimes they, of course, they obey them or interpret them in different ways. So the biggest behavioral insight is the most obvious, obvious one for me. Beware of the response, and I'm going to give you a, a, an interesting uh, example of that soon. Some examples. I'm working with global marine uh, uh, pollution uh, with single-use plastics, we, and, and we, the question underlying this research is how can we build a social norm that takes away single-use plastics from our consumption uh, basket? Uh, a social norm basically is a predominant behavioral pattern and it's, it's backed by an understanding of what is acceptable and what is not. And is, is after you have clarity about that, you, it's sustained through social interactions. So basically, let me put it like that. A social norm is a predominant behavioral pattern. For example, we do not use single-use plastics. It's shared understanding of allowable actions. For example, in, in, it's okay to use single-use plastics in medical use the gloves that doctors use or the, the syringe, it's called syringe, those are good single-use plastics. We should continue, that's allowable. But a, a straw or, or fork and knife, that's not allowable practices. And then it's sustained through social interactions, approval and disapproval. That's basically the basis of a social norm. Uh, and of course, social norms are important because they help us coordinate around a, 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 the, the provision of a public good. And the elimination of single-use plastics is possible only if we agree that we can do well without them. So can we make rejection of single-use plastics a social norm? How is that done? Of course, you can tax the hell out of them, but if not, you can use laws, you can use market-based instruments like rebates and deposit refund scheme. You can have institutional commitment, for example, by big companies or you can have information and attitude campaigns like the one you have there. Straws will only be offered by request. Uh, your mother thanks you. And then there's a picture of the air. That's a, a, a powerful information campaign. There are social comparisons. Maybe you should all of the above. above. The, the ultimate intervention should be drawing bits and pieces from all those options. Um, Another example is uh, this uh, Terrell mosquito. This disease is dengue, chikungunya, Zika. They are all come from the same mosquito. It's uh, the Aedes aegypti mosquito. Uh, it, it, it is very happy in urban environments, very, very happy. Wherever there is stagnant water, the mosquito is around there, in warmer climates, that is. That is gutters, flower vases, pot plants, uh, backyard garbage. If, if water can be collected, if clean water can be collected, then the mosquito is there. Now, the, the only way of getting rid of these mosquitoes is eliminating the breeding grounds through physical removal. Take the water out of the, uh, of the pots or remove your garbage from the, from the backyard and so on and so forth. You can fumigate too, but fumigation is just a, a distant second, second solution. Now, I was working with the Costa Rican government uh, on, on this a uh, long time ago and, and looking at the new law that uh, deals with, uh, with this uh, problem. And they, they have this recommendation. Let's find families with breeding grounds on their premises after inspection. So there is going to be people from the Ministry of Health visiting houses and if you have breeding grounds, you will be fined. So what do you think will happen? 
Well, there is this paper by Nisi and Ruccini that basically they find that there's a kindergarten and parents were coming late. And uh, they thought, oh, let's find parents that come late. So they put a fine. And what do you think happened? No, even worse. More parents start coming late. Because the fine was basically a price on time. So, well, if I'm paying for it, I might as well come late. So the kindergarten said, oh my god, I made a mistake. Let's remove this. You think what, what happened then? Parents continued to keep on coming late. Because now time was monetized, and it was money making the decision. It was not the social norm that was driving behavior. So my, uh, what I would expect would happen in the case of Costa Rican government is that I would wait for the uh, Minister of Health officer to come to my house, get it clean from mosquitoes, and then pay the, the fine if there are any. So this is like paying to get your house clean. But because the Minister of Health cannot have hundreds and hundreds or thousands of thousands of inspectors, what do you think will happen? An outburst of the disease. And uh, the real thing what we need to do is how continue to, I, I believe, is to continue working with social norms in support of the mosquito eradication. And this is a big problem, actually. Taylor and I are thinking a lot on, on how to create behavioral interventions with, with this uh, terrible mosquito. Uh, but this finding families will, I believe, not work at all. One final word when it comes to this, uh, and that is that nudging is not the same as behavioral policies. Uh, there is a definition of the uh, a nudge is a part of the choice architecture that is, that is change, okay, I'm almost done, that is change uh, in a predictable way so that you change behavior. People, people react to that uh, without suffering consequences of that change. For example, having no salt in the table is a nudge. In Mexico, for example, because there was a, a lot of obesity problem and high pressure problems, they, they passed this regulation in which salt cannot be on the table because the people were putting salt without even tasting the food. That's a nudge. But prohibiting sugary drinks in schools, that is not a nudge. That is a intrusive into the decision-making process. Now, nudging is only a subset of tools. I'm not going to go in, into that, but of course it has a, a huge uh, potential. So I want to, to stress, though, that nudging is just part of the decision tool of behavioral economics. Because I come from a developing country, I would like to dedicate these last 10 minutes to what we know about behavioral insights in developing countries. And the answer is almost nothing. Uh, most of what we know comes from weird subjects. These are Western, educated, industrialized, rich, Democrat uh, subjects. And why, why do we expect differences? Let me give you a few examples. First, income level, social norms, and peer comparisons are very different between different countries. So for example, you can have hipsters competing to reduce energy or eating sustainable. You know, I'm vegetarian, well, I'm vegan, type of thing. In South Africa, they did this study recently in which they, they compare, uh, they use social comparisons in aiming to reduce water consumption. And they were very successful in reducing water consumption for the wealthier. When you compare them to the average, the, the wealthier households said, oh my god, I'm consuming a lot, so they reduced their consumption. But the poorer households actually increased their consumption. They see the average and said, oh my god, I'm consuming so much less than the average. No, I'm going to consume more. I'm poor anyway, so at least in one way I should not be the uh, lagging behind. Now, the, the poor population make out 48% of the population, so the end result of that treatment was water consumption went up quite dramatically. Distance of, uh, of social context. We, we use context and social comparisons uh, a lot in order to design behavioral uh, instruments. But people in the developed world are used to very distant social relations. Uh, the reference group is very broad. In, in developing countries, the reference group is very narrow. So it doesn't matter what uh, Yao Ming or Ronaldo say, it is ultimately what your mother says or what your father says. And, and those social comparisons mean that it's very difficult to act, to introduce a behavioral tool 
in such a reduced uh, social comparison group? It's, it's, it's an open question, actually. The other problem that I see is that a strong finding from the literature is that cooperation breaks in the presence of free riding. So you can have a big group cooperating, but when you introduce a free rider or a couple of free riders, people that uh, contribute less than the average or do not match the sort of the excitement of cooperating with each other, quickly the cooperation in the whole group collapses. Yet free riding is very ubiquitous in the developing world. We have a very big informal sector, and that big informal sector still goes for social security, still goes to hospital, still uh, sort of gets conditional cash transfer programs and, and, and so on and so forth. So we need to, in a way, create cooperation in the context of free riding. And there is absolutely no literature uh, in that sense uh, available to actually enlighten our decision. And finally, um, most of uh, what we know about behavioral insights comes from individual decisions, and I've been trying to convince you that behavioral decisions, individual decisions are still important, but uh, we need to know a little bit more about uh, communities, companies, cooperatives, producer associations. Those organizations are very important when it comes to making decisions, consumption decisions too. Uh, and we know also very little about that. So by way of summary, behavioral patterns and habits do matter. They matter a lot. There's a lot of Evidence from developing countries showing, uh, from developed countries, sorry, showing that habits can be altered, can be changed by social influence. They can be changed by changing the choice architecture. And you have uh, uh, a paper there uh, cited from, from your own uh, production. Now, I believe that these behavioral insights, these behavioral tools should be both a complement and, and an input to traditional policy instruments. We should not abandon that, uh, that toolbox of just you know, laws, regulation, pricing, subsidies, taxes. But we know very little on the interaction of these tools. Some of my colleagues, for example, in Colombia working with fisheries have uh, very negative uh, examples of uh, social norms interacting with, for example, prohibitions. If the government comes into a community and uh, starts implementing regulations or prices or subsidies, the social norms collapse. But that's in, in the context of fisheries. It could be different in other settings, and I think we need to learn a lot more. So as a final key message, this pro-environmental behavior needs to be our new habit. It needs to be a new routine in a way. Uh, but for that to happen, we need pro-sustainable policies that are sustainable themselves. And these need to be sustainable in the very long run. We cannot have just temporary patches. And, and behavioral insights are definitely a key input into such policies. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Francisco. Um, we have time for questions now, a good amount of time for that. And also, I just want to put in the plug that after this session, there's a reception set up right outside in the fireplace lounge, so you can keep chatting with Francisco and each other over some food and drinks and things. Okay, so um, we're going to try to move this microphone around those who want to ask questions. So please raise your hand, and I'll get you the mic. But I can let you call on people if you'd like. Thank you very much for the talk. Thank you. Question on the example of shark fin soup and dog lover. Mm -hmm. How do you determine which one is negative and which one is positive? Yeah, like a good question. I, I, and when it comes to the shark fin, that one is negative because it has a, it's a huge impact on, on uh, the shark population in particular. I know the behavior of dog lovers could be negative eventually too, right? The, the sort of food they provide and the amount of money they spend and so on. But what I meant more was that it creates a cohesion around the community that is very strong uh, and it's a, it's a very prosocial type of attitude, right? And that's what I thought was valuable. But sure, the, the food and the expenditure, excessive expenditure on, on food could be bad. 
Now, that is in the eye of the beholder, right? What I'm saying is that you can target that with behavioral instruments, definitely. Uh, thank you. So I had a question about kind of where you ended on thinking about this interaction between sort of our standard policy tools of incentives and fines and that sort of thing and these behavioral thing and the behavioral aspects. And I was wondering how, say in a developing country context, how much we can push the behavioral factors on their own when some of the choices people are making are, are actually in their own self-interest, right? That it, there's an externality problem. Yes. And so even if we can solve the inaction, the paralysis that happens because of status quo bias and discounting and all of that, is there still scope or is it, is it still limited to sort of increasing the effectiveness of these other policies? So let me ask you, when you say that when those decisions are in their self-interest, you mean and they are sort of a, a vulnerable group of society? Yeah, so for example, yeah. like um, I'm thinking about a recent study in, I think it was Uganda, where the farmers were reducing how much they were deforesting their land because they were paid, right? And they were deforesting their land because they were poor. Um, you could have, I mean, maybe I'm being cynical. You could have lobbed all the pro-social messages and to make it as hard as possible to deforest, but ultimately, like, they were just trying to keep their farms yeah, yeah. going. I mean, uh, in, in formal standard economics, right, one should think that if, if there is a contradiction between what is good for the individual and what is good for society, then we should change the behavior of the individual only if society can more than compensate or at least compensate the losses of that change behavior. I've met this so many times in, in my career. You have a farmer and you want that farmer, we were talking earlier uh, on, on, you want that farmer to protect the river. Uh, well, but why that far, if you take 20 meters on each side of the river to create a riparian forest, who's gonna pay the farmer for that? And uh, the farmer has also kids and, and, and family and, and worries about the future and all these things. So we need to compensate that farmer. If we cannot, then society is not valuing that resource and in principle, the farmer should continue business as usual. Now, that's the extreme position. There are other, uh, the other part of the argument is that it could be in the farmer's self-interest to change the behavior and, and there we're just fixing the intertemporal decision-making process. The fact that there is a myopia of intertemporal choices. Uh, so the, the solution in general is very problem specific, but typically we should not change the behavior of a farmer, although of an individual, I'll say, unless society as a whole can compensate that, that the costs assumed by the individual. Yeah, thank you. Who else has a question? Should, you had a question? Well, was, no, that's okay. I was wondering if you had an, any examples of habitual changes that are not dependent on policy implement and policy being implemented. Um, changes in habits. Yeah, changes in habits um, in terms of sustainability. Because I know there are a lot of people in the world, for example, with a lot of uh, desire to make changes towards um, to combat the fight of climate change, but right international bodies aren't doing a thing, so. Well, um, I, I talk about being vegetarian or even being vegan, but I think being vegetarian is more important, or re just reducing the amount of meat. Those are changes in habits uh, that can easily lead to very pro-environmental uh, pro -environmental impacts, uh, climate change being one of them. Um, there are uh, examples of how we use energy in our homes or how we use water in our homes that it requires very small changes in habits, how long you take a shower, uh, whether you leave a light on or not, uh, even technological fixes. Um, so for example, uh, here in all your houses, I'm sure you have these iverters to deliver the water to your houses. This is a small fixture that is at the, at the when you take a shower and you're, uh, in your shower that delivers water with a lot of air so that you have the feeling that you have a lot of water facing you, but it's actually very little water uh, coming out of the, of the, of the faucet or, or the shower. Uh, in many places in the developing world, there aren't such. Uh, so on, on Friday, uh, uh, a little advertising, 
I'm going to be talking about a piece of research with, where we actually installed these devices in many households and did a randomized control trial to explore what is the effect on water efficiency and water use. And one of the findings of that experiment is that people take it off because they cannot make the change towards the feeling of taking a shower, for example, with these fixtures compared to taking a shower without them. So it's a behavioral, it's a change in habits. You're used to taking a shower with some properties, and the fixture actually changes with your property. You're still clean after the shower, or hopefully if you take a good shower, you're clean. <laughs> you're still clean, you took a shower, you're fresh, and everything. It's just that the feeling that you're used to needs to change. And it takes time for that. Uh, so if we saw many households abandoning the fixtures before they actually get used to. And we also saw households that actually remain uh, with the fixtures for longer time, they get accustomed to the fixtures and then continue using them long into the future. So we see this adoption uh, for, for the, because they cannot change habits at the beginning. Uh, that's another example. With energy is another example. Uh, Um, so I'm, I wanted to ask you um, about uh, carbon taxes because um, yes. on the one hand they seem like uh, a really powerful way to make these decisions habitual and automatic because the price is there and yes. it's just about kind of internalizing these externalities. Um, but the kind of the proposals that you hear com coming from kind of some of the conservatives that are pushing the idea of a carbon tax is to you know replace all these other policies with just kind of this one simple carbon tax. Yes. Um, and that seems to me that maybe that's based pretty purely on this idea that we're all very rational, you know, homo economicus. Um, and I'm curious just what your kind of reaction to that policy proposal would be to you know, replace our broad set of individual policies with something like a very simple yeah. across the board carbon tax. I think you, you and I have the same position on this. So let me, the, from an economic perspective, carbon emissions come from such a variety of sources and the cost of reducing uh, carbon emissions is so heterogeneous, it's so different between one industry and the other and so on and so forth, that the, from, from strictly economic speaking, right, the only way to in increase the scale by which we reduce emissions is by increasing the price for all emissions, irrespective of where they come from and irrespective of how costly it is to, to reduce those emissions. And by setting up a tax um, for those uh, industries that is very cheap to reduce, they were emissions, they are going to reduce a lot of emissions. And for those that is very expensive, they are not going to reduce that many emissions, that much emissions. And that is efficient from an economic perspective. So that's basic. Now, the problem, the follow-up problem is, okay, but what do you do with the other policies? That's the first. And what do you do with the revenues of that tax? And there is where there is a lot of disagreement within economists because, uh, for example, I, I agree fully with you that that tax needs to be accompanied, not just by a communication campaign, but by other means that facilitate the switch towards a low carbon uh, economy. Uh, some of them might be behavioral, right? Some, some of them might be, you know, incentives to change your car, for example. You're the carbon tax, but a, uh, a payment for uh, taking old cars out of the road, well, that will make the adjustment to the tax quicker. You remember that, after all, a tax will indeed uh, be hard on people, but so if we make that easier for them, the emissions will, the effect of the tax will be quicker. The simplest example from transportation is you can put a tax and that is going to be hard on people, but if you give people the option of very efficient public transportation, then the burden of the tax, that's the affordable formula, the burden of the tax is much lower because now they have an option. They will continue to take the trips they want just with public transportation. And the second point is what to do with the revenues. Some, some economists argue just put the revenues into the budget of the government. And, and some others argue, well, no, those revenues need to be used precisely to produce that public transportation in a quicker way so that you reduce the burden of taxation as quickly as possible. Nobody likes to pay taxes, so as soon as you can reduce the, the, the burden of taxation, 
uh, the better. And if you use revenues for that, well, so, so that will be a very efficient, a very sort of circle solution. I belong to that group, like, no, just get the revenues and put them uh, as soon as possible to reduce the burden of, of the tax. That would speed up the process. And part of the reason is also I interact a lot with, with um, system ecologists working with climate. Uh, some of my colleagues are, and they have a sense of urgency in when it comes to how quick we need to reduce the, the emissions. That is scary. You know, we need to be much quicker than we are actually being. And for that, I think we need to, to put all our effort into the tax and then into subsidizing activities or investing in activities that are actually low emission. So we have time for a couple more questions. If you haven't gotten one, get my attention because I'll try to move the mic around. So make sure I see your hand. Great, thank you. Um, at the end of your talk, you listed some other areas where we may want to apply <coughs> behavioral economics, behavioral sciences. Um, just to put a plug in there too is, is can we apply these approaches to understanding how policymakers make decisions? How to incentivize them to make the right decisions? And then I guess the question I have, and maybe if you have a comment on that's fine, but is the utilization of these tools uh, by, for, for reasons that may or may not be desirable by us, right? I look at what China's doing with their social impact scoring, incentivizing, visiting your mother mm. by giving you primacy in, in uh, you know, in, in uh, an opera ticket or something along the way, or using big data or remote sensing to understand your behaviors and trying to nudge and incentivize. So are there some limits that, I know there's a critique, critique around paternalism um, and some of the limits of this work. Yeah, so I, I on purpose, don't, didn't want to go into, uh, behavioral uh, interventions of politicians. Because um, yes, they are, you, you can use some of these tools to nudge politicians and, and there is some research trying to understand how politicians uh, perceive these this, uh, instruments. Um, and it's, it's uh, very much along the, the lines that you would expect uh, when it comes to differences in the US versus Europe versus uh, South America versus, you know, you see differences that are aligned with what one would expect. Um, when it comes to your second question, there are of course limits, right, to how much you can intrude. And there is a backslash against the use of these uh, behavioral instruments in, in or nudges uh, more to be more concrete. Because at the end, it's like you're pushing people around to, to behave in one way or another, and there are limits to that. It should be also freedom for them to decide. Now, the key to a, to a nudge or to a behavioral intervention is that it, it shouldn't be too costly to the individual to make the change, right? Because otherwise, you're imposing, it's similar to a, to a policy instrument. It should be something that they do almost automatically without suffering or enduring a big cost. Uh, and as long as we remain within that, I'm, I feel confident that this can be pushed uh, through. But there are very intrusive uh, nudging exercises going around. And, a lot of backslash against against them. Um, so behavior uh, changes are more sustainable in the long run um, than I financial. I hope they're more sustainable. Yeah. But than uh, financial incentives. Uh, like, would you say that that's? Correct? No, I think they're complements, right? Mm -hmm. But we need to make sure that the the policies are sustained in the very long run. And I think a, a behavioral incentives, behavioral tools, or instruments, or policies, uh, should be designed so that even the financial incentives are more palatable, more acceptable in, in the future. So and that will make the policy more sustainable in and on itself. So do you think that if you use financial incentives initially, because they might be more, e like, they might be easier to implement into a society that they will lead to behavioral changes in the long run, or? Do I don't know. It's that's a that's a really good question. I, I don't think that financial incentives are more are easier to implement on the, on the country. I think, for example, with plastic bags, uh, we can introduce sort of a uh, something that 
just instead of getting a bag automatically, you need to ask for the bag, a plastic bag. Well, that's one tiny, tiny change in the decision framework. And then you, you follow up with information campaigns and at, at, after a while, people lose the taste for plastic bags or the urgency to have a plastic bag. So they get used to bring their own plastic bag. And where, where that's the case, uh, you, you hit the industry with a tax on plastic bag. And that could be the end of it. But you know, the, the adjustment in behavior took place before you actually put the tax. The tax is like the final goodbye, right? It could be circumstances in which the opposite is, is, is the case. But one important thing about behavioral economics is that it's very case specific, it's very situation specific. Yeah. Okay, quick question. I've seen um, this approach uh, implemented where the idea is to teach kids in school certain behaviors so that they can bring them home. Let's say yes. they, they do recycling and so it becomes a habit for them. So do you have evidence, I mean, it, would you think of this as a nudge and do you, what is your thing, I mean, your thought about this? Do you think it's effective? Have you seen any good? Well, there is, a, this, uh, there is one interesting case. Uh, the NOAA has developed this package of education for uh, kids in, in, in the US in which they teach them about the implications of using single-use plastics at home. Uh, and the hope is that that will be uh, transmitted to the parents too. Um, so as part of that research that I told you, we we're sort of starting with the marine plastic pollution. We are trying to see if applied those packages developed by NOAA in different countries and then interview attitudinal, cha attitudinal changes both in, in the kids themselves, but also as a follow-up in the parents uh, a few months afterwards and so on. So I think that's uh, something that we, we would like to explore. But Many people claim that uh, household decisions are shaped by what the kids believe is right or wrong. Uh, so I think it's a very promising area uh, of intervention, definitely. 